Greetings, everyone. It's John Tredenick from Catalyst, and I'm thrilled to, uh, to welcome you to our program on using TAR 2.0 to review, reduce review costs. Before I introduce our moderator, I'll just mention two housekeeping things. First, we're recording this presentation, and so it will be available to you or others after the presentation. Uh, for those who have registered and are attending, we're going to send out a copy of the slides and a copy of our book, TAR for Smart People, to you. Look for that tomorrow. Lastly, uh, we have a chat window, and all of us are happy to take questions during the presentation or toward the end. If you just put them in, we're going to be watching for them, and we'll try to work them in as quickly as possible. So let me turn it over to Michael Arkfeld, a friend of mine from the days when he was a U.S. assistant attorney and I was a partner at a law firm, and those are a long time ago. But Michael's blazed the trail in e-discovery and is kind of the leading author in my mind. Uh, and chronicler of the subject, and uh, I couldn't be more excited to, to introduce anyone as, as our moderator today. Michael. Thank you very much, John. I, you know, our lives do intertwine, go back probably about 30 years now, if we say, but um, I want to thank you very much for inviting me to assist in moderating this very important panel. As we all know, the volume of ESI, or electronically stored information, is growing exponentially as we speak, and there does not seem to be an immediate end in sight, especially with the continued development of the Internet of Things and their interconnectedness of data and devices. This particular program, especially TAR 2.0 and computer uh, technology assistance, uh, is very timely, both in the present, it's going to be very appropriate in the future too. Our agenda today is going to be pretty fast moving. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to set it up as, um, as five different uh, parts to our agenda. First one is we're going to be setting the stage, a TAR 2.0 primer. Then we're going to be talking about the practical issues, TAR 2.0 versus 1.0, TAR 2.0 workflow from start to finish, and the law of TAR, which I'll provide a short look, quick look at the state of the law, and finally other ways to use TAR. Our speakers today are some of the most noted in the country. And um, let me go ahead and, and jump right in and provide you a short summary of who they are. Uh, John has already been on the phone for a minute, but he's the CEO and founder of Catalyst. He's a former trial attorney and litigation partner with a large national law firm and has written or edited five books and countless articles on litigation and technology issues. He was recently named one of the top six e-discovery trailblazers by the American Lawyer. He was also named one of the top 100 global technology leaders by London City Tech Magazine. John served as chair of the ABA Law Practice Management section and editor-in-chief of his flagship magazine. Next up is, going to, is David Stanton. He's a partner with Pillsbury, Withrop, Shaw, and Pittman. Uh, he's a partner in the law firm's litigation practice. He leads the firm's nationally recognized information law electronic discovery group, oversees the firm's nationwide litigation support department, and he is a member of the Pillsbury Privacy Data Security Information Use Group. Mr. Stanton is also a member of the firm's Professional Responsibility Committee and serves as Pillsbury's executive partner for anti-bribery, anti-corruption compliance. Finally, we have Mr. Thomas C. Griggs III. He's the managing director over at Catalyst. He's a prominent e-discovery lawyer and one of the nation's leading authorities on the use of TAR in litigation. Tom joined Catalyst in June. He advises corporation and law firms on best practices for applying Catalyst TAR technology, Insight Predict, to reduce the time and cost of discovery. He has more than 25 years' experience as a trial lawyer and in-house counsel, most recently with the law firm Schrader, Harrison, Siegel, and Lewis, where he was a partner and chair of the eDiscovery practice group. So let's jump right into this. John's going to be our first speaker. He's going to be setting the stage for the rest of the program. This is going to be a TAR. 2.0 primer. John. Thank you, Michael. My job is to cover what I usually cover in an hour in 10 minutes or less, and that is just an introduction to technology-assisted review with focus on the difference between the first generation of these TAR engines, TAR 1.0 and TAR 2.0, the, the latest generation. And then we'll spend the rest of the hour talking about why all that matters. So what we're talking about is uh, given many names from predictive ranking, which we called it for many years, predictive coding, technology-assisted review. 
but I'm, I'm talking about not some generic use of computers or technology, but machine learning, an interactive process. And uh, we're going to jump right in to that. Why does this matter? I'm going to take 30 seconds to talk about why it matters. We were working with a client, a large bank. They had 2.1 million documents, which they had already called and searched, and yet they hadn't got the population any smaller, and they needed to do a review. And a sample of those documents showed that really only one in 100, despite their culling, was rich. Now, if David Stan's doing this, it's more like 50 of 100, but not everybody's got those skills. So they had the problem with having to review a lot of stuff to find relatively a small number of relevant. So instead of the traditional linear review, they decided to use our continuous active learning process, which we call CAL. And what happens is the team jumps in, starts reviewing, and the system's watching. And we'll, we'll, we'll go over this, but the system's watching. And as it, people are tagging, it looks for more relevant. Suddenly, the team's seeing 25, 35% relevance. And, uh, and that is actually a message that the system's working. Then after a while, it drops to zero. So we stop the review. What's happened? Well, we do a big sample of what's left over in this population, and we only find two relevant documents out of just under 6,000 that we sampled. What that meant statistically, and we could do a whole program on it, is that the team had found 98% of the relevant documents with a high degree of confidence, and yet they'd only reviewed about 6% of the 2 million, let's say 120,000 documents. What does that mean in a nutshell? I think everybody on this call knows. It means you are able to avoid the cost of reviewing what might be uh, 2 million documents at, pick your number, $1, $2 a document, and you cut 94% uh, or 93% and change of the time it would have taken to get this process done. We all know what the deadlines are like in litigation, and we know what that means. It's a big deal. Whatever system you use, it's a big deal. So let's just hit it. What is technology-assisted review? Really three things in my mind, uh, all pretty obvious. One is it's a process through which humans work with a computer to teach it to identify relevant documents. Machine learning it is. Two, it is the feedback from the computer where it orders the documents by likelihood of relevance, which means you can review more efficiently. The topics are similar, and you're getting to the good stuff at first. Three is frankly optional. It is that the courts have agreed that you can stop your review at a point after you have reviewed a high percentage of relevant documents. In our case, it was uh, where the curve uh, clicked back. I'll just jump back over. Where the curve went, and um, it meant the cost of finding more relevant documents uh, was greater than the value uh, received. So. Is this new? Lawyers always want to know that. The answer is no. We already use it now. Uh, those of you who have used Pandora or Spotify Radio or Apple Radio know that um, this is so. Uh, you, Pandora has uh, ten, tens of millions of songs and only one goal, to play music you like. Well, how does it do that? It doesn't know what you like, but it will allow you to tell it. So you start and say, well, I like Jimmy Buffett and it plays a Jimmy Buffett song, and you're happy. Then uh, the next song might be uh, Zach Brown, which is uh, very much like Jimmy Buffett, and I think the successor of those of you who are fans. And I give it a thumbs up, because I like Zach Brown, I like his music. Well, the next song might be Toby Keith, and forgive me country music fans, but maybe I give that a thumbs down, even though he did duets with Jimmy Buffett. I give it a thumbs down, because it's a little too country for me. Actually, I'm a country fan, but you get the idea. What I've done is I've sent the computer signals about what I like and what I don't like, or what I'm searching for and what, I, what I'm not looking for. And uh, it's performing a predictive ranking, a TAR process, if you will, on the music, and it works brilliantly. That's why Pandora's worth billions of dollars. Well, TAR is exactly the same thing, only it's about documents. So how does this work, the same black box? Uh, there are different approaches used by different vendors. Uh, support vector machines were popular at the beginning. Uh, there are other algorithms uh, that people are using, but none of us as lawyers and non-PhDs in this stuff either understand it or much care. And that's what Judge Andrew Peck said in his landmark decision, the De Silva case. He said, I'm less interested in the science behind the black box than in whether 
it produced responsive documents. In other words, if you can prove that the results are what we're looking for, it's not so important how we got there. We could spend a long time on this topic, but that's it. Often I show the star-bellied Sneetch machine from Dr. Seuss, where the, the Sneetches go in one end of it, and they come out with stars on their belly. And as long as they do, we don't much care how the Sneetch machine works. But we do care about the savings, and we do care about measurements on how it works. And this is how you know. This is how you know. This graph is meant to show and allow us to track the progress of a review and the quest to find relevant documents. So the x-axis is what percent of the documents do I have to review, and the y-axis is what percent of the relevant have I found. Not surprisingly, review 100%, and in theory, you've found 100% of the relevant, although all the studies show that humans miss a great amount of them. So that line we've got here is showing linear review. It simply means that if the documents aren't ordered in any special way, and date and Bates numbers not a special way, then as you review 10%, you'll likely see 10% relevant, 20, 50, you name it. In a TAR type review, the goal is to move the relevant documents to the front of the queue. And we can measure how successful the TAR engine is through a graph like this, and through sampling on that graph or keeping track of the documents we review. So as we find a relevant document, the line goes up. As we find not relevant, the line moves to the right. And this chart shows you that um, the TAR process is working. How do I know that? Well, simply go up the line. And here we found 80% of the relevant documents, roughly. And yet we've only had to look at the first 12% of the stack. That's a great success. Here, farther down, we can actually get to 90% and we've only reviewed a quarter of them. From there, it's very easy to understand the savings. It is the volume to the right of this line times whatever you think the review cost is or whatever your experience is. And so that's the revolution of TAR. And it's not an abstract promise by, by hucksters, frankly, because you control the sampling and the measurements, and the tagging is done by your team, not by anybody else. So, We've talked a lot about TAR 1 and 2, and that's our focus today. So I just briefly want to show you the difference, and then we'll spend the rest of the hour talking about why it might matter to you. So without spending 20 minutes on this, in the first generation of TAR engines, uh, we believe that we had to go through certain processes to make the, the uh, approach successful. And in brief, it meant we collect the documents, and the first thing we did was we had uh, elected a senior subject matter expert, a senior lawyer often, and uh, he or she had to grab 500 documents selected randomly and tag them, and they became a control set or a training set, uh, we, a reference set. We used these to measure the success of our training algorithm. Then the expert would go through a circular training process, different approaches for different of the early vendors, 40 by 40 or review 100, and when you were through tagging, and these would often be selected randomly with some systems or perhaps by the computer. But after you tagged a batch, the computer would go look at what you tagged, try to analyze what the, which words were associated with the good documents and which were associated with the bad ones, but ultimately infer and develop an algorithm, a search if you will, that it tested against the 500 doc control set. And so if you had tagged 57 out of uh, 500 relevant, the system would run its search and say, how close to the 57 did I get? And the measure of that would be how well the algorithm was doing. So you do a circular process, a one-time training process. Uh, but when you were through and the algorithm got no better against the control set, <clears throat> that's when you'd stop. Training was over. And then you would send the algorithm out to the larger population and say, rank everything. And once that ranking was done, You'd split the documents and send the team on to look at the most relevant documents. And that was the process. And for example, if you had a million documents to review, uh, and the system would say with some confidence that uh, if you stop it at rank 400,000, you'll find 75% of the relevant. Well, that's a big breakthrough, and it's why the TAR revolution happened. But many of us started asking the question, why do you just do one round of training? 
you've got all these reviewers reviewing documents, 10,000, 20, 50, as this process goes, why wouldn't you take advantage of their tags as well to make the algorithm smarter? And that was the essence of the continuous active learning revolution, which uh, is a big part of TAR 2.0. So in our world, you collect the documents, but training now is review, review is training. And so we don't use a control set uh, in our TAR 2.0 process. Instead, we rank all the documents, and we built an engine that can do that in about five minutes. <clears throat> so once we did that, we said, well, we'll just keep ranking and work against the entire population, not just a little small control set. And we can measure by the changing in the rankings the documents are going through. So in a nutshell, the process is very simple. Jump right in. If you've got some seeds that you've found through search or interviews or what have you, jump right in and put them in and, and let the system rank and then start reviewing. And the system constantly watches what you like and don't like, feeds you new documents on a continuous basis, and you keep going until you run out of relevant. And when you're finished, you can sample uh, to see what's not being reviewed and to measure with some statistical accuracy what you've left behind, which means what percentage you've got. So again, keeping to roughly my 10 minutes, what is TAR 2.0? Uh, a lot of people think it's uh, all about continuous active learning. I created this term some years ago, and, and, and definitely our beliefs in continuous active learning was an important part of it. Uh, one bite at the apple is not enough, but it's never been all of it. In our world, and what we challenge with the five minutes of TAR is, we said you don't need senior lawyers to do training, not in a TAR 2.0 continuous active learning system, and we showed research. Let the reviewers do it, and it works. We rank against all the documents. We don't believe in control sets. Uh, in a TAR 2.0 world, you properly tokenize foreign language documents uh, before you run them through. And, uh, and we use a thing called contextual diversity rather than random sampling so that you can go find what you don't know. And we're going to talk about more of those later. So I just wanted to give you an overview and turn it back to, to Michael. Thank you, John, very much. Um, you've set a solid foundation in terms of what is TAR, Technology Assisted Review, and the differences uh, that we've moved on from TAR 1.0 to TAR 2.0 and continuous active learning. Now we're going to hear from David Stanton about some of the practical issues involved with TAR 2.0 versus 1.0. David? Yeah, thanks. So, you know, as John pointed out, the TAR 1.0 workflow is kind of a one and done scenario that you have a subject matter expert who's going to code up seed set of documents and look at a control set of documents, and then there's going to be a stabilization process, and then you're going to build an algorithm. And that introduces a lot of kind of vulnerabilities and areas for the process to be challenged that you just need to think about. I mean, TAR 1.0 has great benefits over linear review. Um, sometimes it makes sense to use. It's maybe it might be good if you're not going to review the documents, the responsive documents before you produce them, but you really need to be thoughtful around where these vulnerabilities are. Um, the first is that whoever that subject matter expert is, that single person, um, you know, their review is going to be really subject to the vagaries of human error. Um, you know, studies have shown that even when you have expert reviewers looking at the same set of documents, they might have overlap only about 75% of the time. Um, this is called the Jacquard distance. This measures the disagreement you know, between two uh, variable estimations. And that Jacquard distance leaves a whole lot of room for controversy and a whole lot of room uh, for your requesting party to come after you and challenge the sufficiency of that initial training that was done. Um, you know, it also requires, that workflow requires somebody who's a subject matter expert. And in my experience, defining that person early on in the case when you're performing the TAR 1.0 training is really difficult. Um, you know, can you get a senior partner to review a large enough set of documents to comprise your, your, your control documents? You know, do they want to look at all of those non-responsive, uh, randomly selected documents that need to go into that training process? Are they going to have time for that? Are they going to stick around for the stabilization steps? Um, you know, if you have buy-in, that's, that's great, but that can be challenging. And also, early on in the case, you know, is the senior partner really the person who has the most knowledge about the documents? Um, at that point? Uh, or is that somebody more junior who really is the most knowledgeable person about how the documents should be ordered? Um, 
you know, and is that junior person, if they take on those responsibilities, going to be able to defend those decisions later on? Um, you know, there's also this huge problem just that you don't know at the beginning of a review what relevant documents look like. You know, it's kind of this picture of the jigsaw puzzle all jumbled together. You don't know until you've sort of put the corners around the jigsaw puzzle and establish the edges how you're going to start to fit the rest of the pieces in. And doing the document review is very much like that. You start to find the relevant documents, you find responsive documents, you find tangentially responsive documents, and you begin to understand something about how the corpus all fits together. And it's very difficult to have that insight into a, you know, a large distribution of documents and emails collected up from you know, a, a long list of custodians to really know uh, where all that is going to find, so where that's going to lead. So it's really hard to make those correct responsiveness assessments early on in the case. Um, you know, it's also you're going to make all those decisions early on in the case, but it's not going to be until the end of the case that your decisions are going to get challenged, and hindsight's going to be 2020. And so the party challenging your predictive coding efforts is going to have the benefit of um, that more holistic understanding. Um, you know, also this seed set of documents that you're relying upon just creates a lot of room for controversy. It's something that can be attacked. It's something that can be reviewed. A lot of attorneys and clients have very strong views about sharing uh, non-responsive documents that are used as part of the TAR training mechanism. So there are issues there just to be sensitive about. I think TAR 2.0 um, does something that I, I consider sort of akin to harnessing the, uh, the wisdom of the crowd. And you may have heard of this, but you know, the basic Cognitive research has shown that large groups do a better job at estimation tasks like guessing quantity or spatial relationships um, than individuals. At least as good as individuals, oftentimes better, and oftentimes the crowd together is more accurate than anybody um, in the crowd. I think the classic example is a country fair in uh, Plymouth in 1906 where a bunch of people were going to weigh, uh, guess the weight of a slaughtered uh, ox. And a statistician observed that the median guess was within 1% of the ox's actual weight. And basically, it's led to an insight that a, uh, individual judgments can be looked at as a probability distribution uh, where the median um, is centered near the true, or the mean, I'm sorry, the average is centered near the true, you know, sort of right answer. Um, and, and basically, we use this all the time, you know, just as John was pointing out. We're used to TAR 2.0. We're also used to crowdsourcing. You know, trial by jury is a kind of crowdsourcing rather than relying upon trial by judge by a single expert. Um, you know, and basically what happens, what the studies have shown is that the sort of use of crowds to make these estimations um, eliminates individual noise, human error. And studies have shown that the issue with document review is not so much a difference in opinion, but again, human error that the issues tend to focus around, you know, somebody's sleepy or they hit the wrong button or they just missed something when they were reading through it. And all of that kind of noise in the individual review gets smoothed out uh, with a crowdsourced uh, solution. Um, so, you know, all of that is really helpful. I think that, um, I'm trying to get to the next slide and it's not letting me. There we go. Uh, one more before that, please. Yeah, so one of the tricks that you'll want to work on when you're working with a crowd, though, is that crowds do really well when there's a correct answer. And, you know, we like to model and think about a responsive document as a binary decision. It's either responsive or it's non-responsive. It's a yes or a no. It's an obvious solution. But really, every document requires some kind of a map to determine whether or not it fits against what we intend responsiveness to mean. And it's one of the most important sort of practical things I can leave you with when working in any of these, you know, any kind of document review really, but particularly when working with these TAR 2.0 to get the most bang for your buck out of it, you need to align your reviewers so that everybody shares a common understanding about what the responsive document, what a responsive document looks like. Um, you know, that crowds aren't always right, right? I mean, stock bubbles show us that crowds aren't going to get it right all the time. And, you know, it's a fallacy in logic to say, um, you know, a proposition is true because everybody believes it. If a lot of people believe it, it must be so. Um, that, that's a logical fallacy. So we have to do something to sort of correct against this. Um, and it's really important to, under, to define your responsiveness. And what I mean by responsiveness is responsive to the, the stated requests, subject to the objections of counsel, you know, as interpreted by the subject matter expert. 
Um, and it's important to sort of share that interpretation with the team. You don't want to leave the decision about what responsiveness means to the reviewers. You want to leave the coding of the document, the determination whether a particular document meets the responsiveness categories to the reviewers, but you don't want them to have any ambiguity around what a responsiveness document is. So it's really important to simplify the responsiveness criteria as much as possible in advance and then tweak it um, to match reality as you go along. So early on in training, you want to provide context. You want to share the pleadings with the team. You want to share the requests with the team of the objections, present examples, post hypotheticals, and ultimately leave them with some kind of a guide a guide or a chart that tells them what a responsive document is, that, they're supposed, that will sort of be the final arbiter of whether responsive, uh, a document that qualifies as responsive or not. You, know, you give them a map and then drill the map. And by the time they get to the documents, they should have that sort of map or set fixed in mind and have a, a, a chart to sort of pair it along with. So we might think of responsive categories as, you know, it mentions one of the entities at issue, one of the individuals at issue, so it talks about one of the events at issue and one of the agreements at issue. And then we'll you know, create sub-tags under that and have those be coded and we can QC against those as we go along. David, I got a quick thing, question uh, from the audience. Yeah. What would be the minimum number of reviewers acting as the crowd needed to model the responsiveness of a document? Well, anybody, you know, I mean, I use this as an analog to, to uh, you know, crowdsourcing, and the larger the crowd, the more helpful it's going to be. Um, but you can use TAR 2.0 technologies as a single reviewer. They're still going to allow you to amplify the assessment. You know, they sort of serve two functions. One in the TAR 2.0 model, it allows you to aggregate assessments. Um, and, but you know, what the model is also allowing you to do is to amplify assessments and to, make, uh, to create an algorithm you know, based upon a limited number of uh, reviewed documents. So it kind of goes either way. Uh, you know, I think that the, that the crowd analogies hold up reasonably well, but it's not a necessary component to doing the TAR 2.0. I just want to say a couple of things about QC if we can advance the slide uh, one more. Oh, there we go. So um, you know, lawyers have to supervise document production. And I think a lot of people working with vendors or working with managed review services forget that it's the responsibility of the lawyers who are appearing before the court to actually know what's going on and to actually supervise the process. And it's really important um, to kind of gain insights into what's happening in a document review uh, so that you can you know, make representations about it and understand that things have been coded up correctly. Uh, you, know, you, you, you need in any workflow some kind of a mechanism to do that. We can do a lot of sampling against uh, you know, document sets at various levels. We can look at the documents we didn't produce and sample those to see, verify and validate that uh, we didn't, you know, we had sufficient recall. Uh, but one of the things that's really brilliant about these TAR 2.0 workflows is they're constantly and continuously ranking all the documents for you. So it becomes a lot easier to notice an outlier document where you will see, you know, just straight in front of you very visually, that you know, the, do the algorithm is suggesting that there's a 95% percentage uh, likelihood that a document is relevant and it's been marked as non-relevant. Um, that's a document that's going to require further QC. So it gives you more discrete insight into quality control than, um, than you might get just from sampling. I guess one other thing that I'll say is you know, one of the things that these TAR 2.0 workflows allow is kind of a swarming approach where you can create almost instant feedback. You, know, you can have documents get reviewed uh, by somebody on the review team, escalated to you know, some percentage of those get escalated to somebody on the quality control team, and you can provide feedback back to the group which instantly gets incorporated into those um, those iterations that John mentioned, which can be run continuously or daily or what have you. So that kind of an approach proves to be the most effective. Mm. Two comments I wanted to make, and he was about a minute away from the end of that. Um, tell me when you're back on, David, if you are. Uh, one is that I've had the opportunity to do a lot of writing and review just about every case on e-discovery in both federal and state level. And one of the issues that comes up with uh, technology assisted review is the challenges to it on a legal basis. And David made a couple of great points. One of them is if you're working with TAR 1.0 and you use seed sets, it does open up the seed sets to legal challenges as we saw in the De Silva Moore case and some other cases. 
Uh, if you're doing the continuous active learning, then you've got a situation where you don't argue over the seed sets because you're constantly bringing in new documents and that. Obviously, you're going to have to document your process and which is how many documents you start off with and as you're tagging them or something of that nature. But I will say I, you know, this appears, at least at first glance, to reduce the challenges to uh, Technology Assist Review TAR 2.0. Um, the other Michael, issue that, uh, Michael, I'll just say Judge Peck alluded to that in the Rio Tinto decision where the parties were using TAR 1 and fighting over the seed sets, and the judge said, dicta albeit, that wouldn't have had this issue if you were using a TAR 2.0 Cal process because every document you tag is a seed, and uh, mm -hmm. you produce all your seeds when you make your production. Simple as that. Mm -hmm. Excellent point, John. Um, the other thing, and, and one that really hasn't been deci I mean, decided very closely yet by the courts, is the adequacy of your search. And as David was saying, the adequacy of the search can be um, determined easier under this methodology than the TAR 2.0. Um, I'm waiting to see those decisions come out, both federal and state courts. So let's move on to the next section, TAR 2.0 workflow. And that's going to be Tom. Tom, are you ready for this? Uh, I am, Michael. Thank you very much. And, uh, and now that we've covered some of the general issues, some of the practical issues, what we really want to do is dig into the weeds of the TAR workflow so everyone can see how TAR 2.0 really works. And frankly, we have several questions from the audience that really should be answered when I go through this whole workflow scenario. So let's, let's take a look first at an overview of TAR 2.0. And, and what I want everyone to understand is when we talk about TAR 2.0, from the perspective of the catalyst approach to it, it's more than just continuous active learning. It's continuous active learning, but it's also what we call contextual diversity, going out to look for things that you actually don't know anything about so that you make sure you've penetrated that database, that collection, as much as you possibly can. And it also includes an algorithmic QC that, so that you can make sure when you're looking at the issues that David is dealing with, with reviewers and a number of reviewers checking these things, you can make sure that the reviewers are getting it right and they're being consistent. So this is an overview of what the process is, and then we'll dig into it step by step. But let me walk through it. You collect and receive the documents. You put them into the tool. You do some level of seeding or training so that you can get the algorithm to understand what it is you're looking for. What's a good document? What's a bad document? As you do that, the algorithm in the background will take that information and it will rank the entire collection from, from the best documents, which it pushes to the top, to the ones least likely to be positive that it pushes to the bottom. And so how does that work? The way that works is once that ranking happens, the documents are available to the reviewers who go grab batches so that they can grab them from the top of the ranked list, which are the documents most likely to be positive. And once those reviewers get the documents, they train the tool. They actually teach the tool. Review is training, and training is review with continuous active learning. And in the background, we have the contextual diversity and algorithmic QC running. And then that cycle repeats itself essentially until you've depleted the positive document set in the collection. So let's look at step one. Step one is the collection. And when I say collection, you import any collection and multiple collections when you're using continuous active learning. It's never a problem. Talk about the collection. Predict operates on text. It is a text engine. So what we're trying to do is find the text that we would believe would be positive. The important thing is with a continuous active learning tool, you can put any documents, any collection in at any time. And so rolling collections are seamless. And the way that works is those documents just get incorporated into that ranked collection that I was talking to you about. The ranking happens, and when the initial collection comes in, it's random. As the tool learns, as the ranking improves, the documents get ranked from best document to least likely to be positive. And when rolling collections come in, each of those documents then gets, gets 
uh, identified by the algorithm and slotted into the rank based on the existing coding and the words that appear in the new documents that are brought in. And of course, certain documents, non-text documents, end up being unranked, and you have to deal with those in a different way. But once the uh, collection comes in, the, the, the first thing that you really have to do is seed or train the algorithm. You really have to try to get that algorithm started and kickstart the ranking. But the nice thing about a continuous active learning tool is that training is immediate and is happening all the time. You can use any documents you want to seed. You can use a random set of documents where you have some positive, some negative, if you want to do that. But better yet, you can use judgmental seeds because what you really want to do if you can is really kickstart that ranking as well as you possibly can to identify good documents. So for example, in one case that we had, they used 49,000 documents that they knew were positive because they were in a companion litigation. And that really kickstarted the ranking and was able to actually pull all of the good documents to the top of the ranked list. You can also use synthetic seeds created from whole cloth that contain all of the information that you're looking for because continuous active learning has been analogized to a bloodhound. If you just put it on the scent of what you're looking for, it will start down the trail and find more of them for you. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. You can use any number of documents that you want, but the critical point to understand about PREDICT and about continuous active learning, if it's done right, is that every single attorney decision will be used in the review process, or if you have attorneys out doing search and they find good documents and they code them as positive, those should be used as well to improve that ranking. It's what I like to call one-touch coding because you look at a document once, and after that, that document's coded and it improves the ranking, and you move on to the next document. So what happens? After you seed the tool, the algorithm then takes the information that you give it on what you like and what you don't like, and tries to find those patterns in the documents, and then ranks every single document in the collection based on how much it resembles what you said was good and how much it is different from that and resembles what you said is bad and creates that ranked collection pushing the good documents to the top so that they are available for review. One of the things to uh, pay attention to is how often that ranking occurs. With PREDICT, ranking occurs every 10 minutes. So some tools do it very often. Ranking actually occurs every several uh, minutes, even, more, even less than 10 minutes. But I took a look at this issue some time ago just to try to understand it because some tools will only rank once per day. If you rank once per day, you're actually losing the benefit of 48 times the reviewer decisions. So this kind of is, uh, goes to a question that was asked a minute ago, and that is, how big should these batches be? In that sense, the batches we like to say should be fairly small. If reviewers are getting through 50 or 60 documents an hour, you want to keep it no bigger than that so that they're getting through those documents and you're getting the benefit of decisions that are made sooner rather than later. If the batches get too big, you're not getting decisions for some time, so you're not taking advantage of the latest reviewer decisions. After the ranking happens, the documents are passed on to the reviewers for review and coding. And the critical point here is they're passed on with, uh, from the top of the list with the most likely positive documents coming out first so that the reviewers are getting what the tool recognizes as being the best documents and then coding that to further train the tool. Because as we say, review is training and training is review. While that's happening in the background, we're running contextual diversity and algorithmic QC to monitor the process and to find documents that you may not know about. So let's talk about that for a second. Contextual diversity, that's a way of effectively finding the unknown documents. When you talk about unknowns, you actually look at the pictures here. These are based on a linguist's model of natural language that says that documents are grouped in ever smaller circles and groups of documents so that if you're looking for those unknown documents, you really want to go out and look not only at the large groups, but at the much smaller groups as well. You have two ways to do that, random 
sampling or we use contextual diversity. With random sampling, the problem is you get a lot of documents from the bigger groups and not a lot of documents from a lot of the smaller groups. So you miss those groups. So you don't get that penetration into the collection. Contextual diversity, on the other hand, goes out and looks for those groups of documents that the tool knows nothing about. And it takes the most representative document, the document that is going to tell the algorithm the most about that group, and brings it back and kind of peppers it into the review set, into the batches that the reviewers are looking at, so that the reviewers actually have to make a decision about those documents. And as soon as a decision is made on one of those documents, the entire group can then be ranked based on that coding so that all of the other documents will come up in due course based on the ranked list. So we actually are out looking for documents that you don't know and trying to penetrate the database as far as you possibly can. I want to talk a little bit about quality control because we do it a little bit differently than most. This is a picture of typical quality control. You take a look at the ranked list. You look at the top of the list where the tool says everything is highly ranked, and you take the documents that are negative, and you look at those. You go to the bottom of the list where things should not be positive, and if you see any positive documents, you take a look at those. That's how it's typically done. We have actually tried to do it a little bit differently to actually focus a little bit more on evaluating the specific calls that are being made. So we actually do two separate rankings. At the same time as we're doing the regular ranking for the documents, we also do two QC rankings. We check the positive calls, and what we do is we model all the negative documents. We say, okay, what makes a document negative? And then we look, we grab the positive doc coded documents and we rank them based on their likelihood of being negative. And so as you can see here, the documents that are most likely negative float to the top. And if you find any that truly are negative, they're overturns. Similarly, we do exactly the opposite for the negative calls. We model the positive documents, and we rank the negative documents by their likelihood of being positive. So we're trying to really focus in on both calls that you make so that you can take a look at really how well those calls are being made and evaluate not only the review itself, but the reviewers if necessary. And every time you overturn a document, you are improving the ranking as well. Step five is really the critical one, and that is review, rank, repeat. That's precisely what we do. This is a process that goes around. You look at documents while you're continuously training the tool against the entire collection. It's being ranked. It's passing good documents to reviewers. And that continues essentially until you deplete the pool of responsive documents. And so our typical endpoint is near depletion. So you can see the grayed out bars here are the progress as the tool continually pushes documents to the top. And the, the last grayed out bar, if you see it, would be perfect. All of the best documents, all of the responsive documents at the top. That will never happen. It doesn't happen with any tool. So how do you figure out when you're done? Well, when you see that you're not finding any more responsive documents, as in the uh, picture where the arrow is, you're, you stop finding responsive documents. That's not happening anymore. You can pretty much be sure that you're done. And at that point, we go out and do the validation to show everyone that we've actually achieved the level of recall that was necessary for the case. Michael? Thank you very much, Tom. That was great in terms of um, you know, talking about uh, the workflow of TAR and the different issues that arise during that process. Very interesting. I would like now to give a quick look at the state of the law regarding TAR. It's actually going to be um, quick for a couple of reasons. One of them is uh, we've listed most of the cases there that uh, deal with TAR as an issue in federal court primarily. There are some state cases. And two is I want to get to some of the questions that I know several, many of you have asked during this presentation. The first thing I want to mention is, and this comes up quite frequently in different presentations and panels I'm on in some of my research, um, as a litigator or as a person disclosing information to the other side, uh, pursuant to request to produce or something of that nature, uh, you have an obligation <coughs> as an officer of the court to, to do a reasonably comprehensive search. 
this, um, generally speaking, under, with paper, we did not have any obligation to tell the other side who reviewed the paper, what uh, boxes we went through, what storage facilities and that. But this trend is shifting with TAR and keyword searching, and conceptual searching and that. We're getting more parties challenging the other side's use of technology assist review uh, or these type of things in order to you know, see if, if they got all the responsive documents. This is a very difficult area. And the reason I say that is because, as John mentioned, we're getting results now using uh, TAR of up to 80% of responsive relevant documents, up to 90% depending upon the number that you review for relevancy in the ranking process. This is wonderful because just with manual review, our, many of the studies show we only get up to like 70% of the relevant responsive documents. And so we're, actually the accuracy of the computer versus manual is, is, is better than increasing over manual review. But going back to law again, <clears throat> whatever search method you use, the court's going to look at it whether you apply TAR or any of the other methods. And they're going to say, have you done a, they're going to say, um, the court applies a reasonable net test to this. Have you conducted a reasonably comprehensive search on that? Uh, so that's the standard that you're going to use. Number two is when you certify your responses, um, request to produce, and you use TAR, and you provide the documents to the other side, you have an obligation before signing off on that request to produce in your answers uh, of making a reasonable inquiry into your client's ESI. And that includes both the identification, the preservation, the collection, and the review of those documents. And David mentioned earlier that we have an obligation, even I mean, we have an ethical obligation to ensure that we made a reasonable inquiry into the use of TAR or other methodologies for that. So this is the, you know, the general concept or general principle I'll lay out for you is that you have an obligation to do a reasonably comprehensive search throughout this process. Now specifically with TAR, we have a situation where in the Silvermore, Judge Andrew Peck there um, said quite clearly in 2012 in the first decision on this that this judicial opinion now recognizes that computer assisted review is an acceptable way to search for relevant ESI in appropriate cases. And so he gave his blessing to it at that point. Since that time, we've had many, many other cases, which you'll see in some of the other slides, uh, that have uh, okayed the use of uh, predictive coding, TAR, um, and continuous active learning. One area I would like to mention are the new amended federal rules that went into effect December 1st of last year. Now, there are some major, major changes to the federal rules, and I'm sure the states are going to pick them up eventually here. Uh, the number one uh, change to those rules was regarding proportionality. And you know, what the courts did and the committee and the uh, U.S. Supreme Court signed off on these in April of last year is to say that because of the large volume of data today, that it should be, discovery of that data should be proportional to uh, the case itself. And they list four or five factors there. Um, and that proportionality principle runs throughout all the changes. It applies the interrogatories, request to produce, scope of production, and even the Rule 37E curative measures and sanctions. The point I'm, I, I need to make here, want to make here, is in terms of using TAR is going to impact the proportionality principles that have been set out in the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. And so be aware that when you're requesting information from the other side, the <clears throat> use of TAR by the opposing side will actually get you more information, more relevant information. Um, I was um, in, in a conference we had last year, I mean this year in March, uh, a number of federal judges were on a panel, and I asked them whether technology assist to review of this nature would make an impact on proportionality argument before the court. And Judge Campbell, Judge Rodriguez out of Texas, Judge Shinlin, and several other, they all said affirmatively yes using this technology would make a difference in terms of the proportionality arguments being placed. So uh, be aware that the, this is a real changing area of the law. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, under certain circumstances, your use of keyword searching, concept searching, TAR, TAR 1.0, TAR 2.0, it's going to be attacked by the other side. 
And so document your efforts very carefully and, um, and do the Q QC test as they were talking about. Uh, again, here's several you know, the cases, National Day of Labor or a case that I, I definitely recommend you to read National Day of Labor because Judge Schindler there talked about the adequacy of the searches. Um, several of these other ones bring up different issues about the search process. And as I mentioned, it's, we're becoming somewhat transparent and cooperative in the search method. And part of the reason for that is because you have several, uh, you have the volume information, number one. Number two is we know for a fact that you're not going to retrieve all 100% of the relevant responsive data. And so one of the methods of decreasing any kind of um, motion to compel or motion for sanctions or anything is to cooperate with the other side. Uh, and the courts want you to. They want you to be diligent, use good faith, and cooperate with the other side because that isn't where everything is, is um, should be focused on in a case. It should not be focused on arguments over the pretrial discovery in that if both sides can agree and cooperate with each other. It should focus on the merits of the case. And eventually the courts are you know, saying not only does it help our justice system, but it increases access to our justice system because the cost of litigation will decrease as we cooperate and use uh, tools such as TAR 2.0 and those type of things. Um, so finally, you know, the final slide I want to show here, Judge Peck again, if you have a chance to listen to him, he's quite entertaining and quite insightful in the law. Uh, but he said case law has developed to the point where it's black letter law that if a party wants to utilize TAR for document review, courts will permit it. And that's unanimously, I agree with him in terms of all my discussions with federal and state judges across the country. So. Let's go ahead and um, finish up here in terms of having Tom speak a few minutes in terms of other ways to use TAR, and not only Tom, but, uh, but John and David also. So who wants to start that off? And Michael, I suggest we can work some questions in as well. Okay. Yeah, let, me just jump on, we let me just jump on this one because I think we can answer a bunch of things. Uh, we use it with outbound productions, obviously. And I also always suggest to everyone run a privilege ranking at the same time so you can QC it before production to sleep better at night. But the point that I really want to raise for that is when, when, we do the, uh, when we do the predictive ranking, we can actually do as many of those on any number of different issues that, as you want to do. So you can do more than one. You can do different witnesses, different issues, and we can run different rankings at the same time, all running simultaneously, all different rankings. So you can use it for outbound productions, privilege, as well as issue review, witness prep, the, the like. We had a question about plaintiffs who are typically getting documents produced to them. And the question was, what's, what, what's the difference in the workflow? Uh, from my perspective, uh, the, the difference is not, uh, not very significant. You can actually create a predictive ranking that says, okay, I want to go look for hot documents. At that point, you can actually seed the tool either with, for example, synthetic seed or do some searches to find what you're liking, and then seed the tool and have the tool then start ranking the documents on the basis of the hot documents and pulling them right up to uh, the reviewer so they can find them sooner rather than later. And as this uh, slide says, because you are ranking those documents based on the decisions about what's good or bad and pulling the good stuff to the top, you can find those relevant documents, the hot documents, in much less time than it would take to actually go through and review that entire collection or search through it to find everything for that matter. I've got a question for David Stanton if I could. Sure. David. Uh, one of the problems is that TARS tells you uh, exactly what percent of responsive documents you left on the table, whereas with linear review, and I'm reading the question, attorneys say they give you everything responsive. That's probably not true, in fact, but how do you overcome the inevitable objection that you didn't produce, say, 20% of the requested records? Uh, it's a great question, and I think a sensitivity that everybody needs to bring to mind, because what's happening through the challenges to TAR workflows is that we are learning to apply statistical metrics to
through the process of document review and production so that we can actually assess you know, quality measures like precision and recall, which give us you know, a, a sort of more substantial basis to say that we did everything that we were supposed to do. So what's happening in a linear review is we're just masking um, non-responsive documents that didn't get produced. Uh, you know, the, if you apply the same kind of metrics in a linear standard workflow that we apply in a TAR 1.0 or 2.0 workflow, you'll identify responsive documents that didn't get produced. Uh, you know, it's just a consequence of human error. And that goes to your second point. I mean, human error is a reality in any kind of review. Um, you know, our requirements are to do a reasonable inquiry uh, and you know, produce documents, do a reasonable job of producing documents. Case law is consistent with that standard. And reasonableness is not perfection. 100% is not the standard. Um, you know, it's not always entirely clear exactly what the standard should be. But what I find is that once we reach that threshold where we're no longer finding responsive documents, what we might, you know, we can then sample. We can see what the percentage of non-responsive documents left over is. We can actually look at them and use them to typecast the kinds of responsive documents that haven't been found yet. And typically what we find is that after what we think is a reasonable breakpoint, what we're finding are documents that are largely duplicative or falling into some responsiveness category that was imprecisely applied, uh, resulting in kind of an outlying trend among the documents. So if you look at the, the cutting room floor, you analyze what's on the cutting room floor, and then sort of you know, develop an understanding and ability to articulate uh, the justification for cutting off where you did, and that's about the best you can do. You know, can I add two things, John, if I may? Yes. One is I, I do concur with what David said. And, and just to add on to that, um, which was very well stated, is that the case law and the judges don't, do not expect perfection in this area. It's reasonably comprehensive searches, reasonable steps that you've taken. If you, quote, have not done that, and if anybody's feeling like they may be exposing themselves to risk, go to Rule 37E of the new Federal Rules and read the rule plus the, um, the comment to that. It, it really allows more leeway in this area. The other thing I just wanted to mention quickly is, and I'd like to have David's perspective on the auto categorization of your privileged data. That's really important because of the amount of privileged information that TAR 2.0 is used for categorization and location of privileged documents, and also using auto categorization kind of privilege log as opposed to logging each one of those individual email or whatever you have in terms of your ESI population. Good points. Let me add one other thing. In the TAR 1.0 world with one-time training, the systems were excited about finding 75% of the relevant documents. And so there was a debate and, and a certain amount of heartburn over uh, missing 25% of, of, of relevance. Uh, as we moved into continuous active learning, we're regularly seeing above 90% kind of recall. That's not a guarantee, and it's not to say it's always that. But the 75% is, uh, to my mind, substandard uh, in a TAR 2.0 world. And so I think it's a very different discussion if you can say, we found over 90% of the relevant documents. And John, one other quick thing. Uh, you recall I had to fight this exact issue in global aerospace. Why did I cut off at 75? And if you really want to understand it, look at some of the early studies by uh, Moore Grossman and Gordon Cormack by EDI that show that human review is on average 68% recall. And keyword search is somewhere less than that. And so you can, by doing that, look at setting kind of yardsticks for where technology-assisted review is. And as you said, we've gone from 75 to now up to 90. And uh, that, that is a fantastic jump from where linear review would be. Last question, since we always try to keep it on the hour. But David and Tom, uh, there's a question about using uh, TAR for other things, like early case assessment or investigation. What do you think? In, uh, a minute or, or less. Go ahead, David. Yeah, you know, we use it in investigations all the time. It's really great given the, you know, condensed time frame you also often have in that context. You know, as has been explained, you can create synthetic documents along the type that you're looking for. You can hone in on a narrow set of issues and just kind of extrapolate out from there uh, during your review. It's super powerful. Uh, almost. Um, yeah, I wouldn't do anything else in the investigation context. You don't have time to negotiate keywords. Uh, you're really trying to get to a fact early on on behalf of your client, give them the best information.
possible. I think best practice at this point in that context is TAR. Incoming productions is also uh, really useful, particularly if it's documents coming in where you have um, parties on either side of the case who have been communicating with each other. If we've already coded up our documents, we can just overlay the incoming production, get the benefit of the relevance assessments that we've already applied to our population, and have that algorithm you know, then expanded to include the incoming production, and uh, it works out brilliantly. So you know, a lot of alternate uses for the technology. Could be used in the due diligence context as well. Um, you know, just any time you have a large data set and you need to make some sense of it, I think these TAR 2.0 tools are, are definitely the way to go. And I uh, couldn't have said it better. I, I mean, the fact is this tool is intended to bring the good stuff to you sooner. So as a result, you're going to see the, the good documents sooner rather than later. It's going to be useful for early case assessment, grabbing documents in investigations, times when you need to pull all of that good stuff to the top sooner rather than later. So yeah, it's, it is very useful for those purposes. Well, it's John Trudenick jumping in to say thank you to everybody for joining us on this program. We could always go longer, but we want to be respectful of your time, and so we've tried to cram as much as possible in. They say you get what you pay for. This one was free, but I'm hoping it's well worth the money. So I want to thank you. <laughs> well worth what you paid. I want to thank you to Michael Arkfeld for coming in and both speaking and moderating, for David Stanton, who in my mind is one of the most sophisticated TAR users out in real practice today. I would have said Tom was, but we stole him out of his farm so he doesn't get that. And me, I'm the dumb lawyer who just loves to learn about this stuff and have fun with it. And so uh, from all of us, uh, tell us if you want more of these kind of very specific programs, and we'll do them. And we're happy to talk to anybody offline uh, because there's so many good questions. And also, we're rolling out a new feature on our blog, the Catalyst Search blog. I should have made a picture of it. But uh, you can get it on the Catalyst site. It's called Ask the Expert. And we're taking questions like, in fact, I got several here, and, and we're just answering them or giving you our views on it. So uh, uh, I want to thank everybody, uh, and it couldn't have been more fun today. Thank you very much, John. Enjoyed it. Yeah.